A big hello from Paris to all of our Facebook followers and friends, our community on Facebook. Uh, we're doing another Facebook Live here, live from Paris uh, at UNESCO headquarters, where just literally a few moments ago, we announced a uh, new initiative that we're undertaking with an uh, organization here in France called INRIA. We'll learn a little bit more about INRIA, but more about the project that we're doing together from Roberto Di Cosmo who is the director of Software Heritage. I would venture to guess that if you're following us right now live, or if you see this later on in the day, you're doing it on your computer, you're doing it probably on your phone, and if so, there's source code involved in making it possible for you to be part of this and us to be part of your life in such a way that uh, makes it seem seamless. So source code, a part of our life, but do we really know what it is? What is source code? <laughs> okay, so thanks, George, for this question. I mean, uh, you're right. If you look around us, there, we, there is software everywhere. It makes, it's, in, it's a fabric that binds together our personal, professional lives all the time. But what is software? Software is a sequence of instructions which are executed by a computer, but these instructions are, are not coming out of nowhere. These are written by programmers, developers, scientists, researchers, all the day in a programming language. And this particular form of the software that they write is called the source code. Because then later on there are tools that convert the source code, which is human readable, into a version which is directly machine executable. It's a kind of a very special form of new knowledge. It's a knowledge which is made for human to read and to write, the developers do it, and for machine to execute. Okay, so now that we have created an archive, is what the Software Heritage Initiative is about, the, the question is why? Why do we have to create an archive for source code? Yeah, that, that's a, a very good question. Actually, you, we have to think about the fact that computer science and computer technology was jo born just half a century ago. It's a very recent invention of mankind. And we, unfortunately, up to now, did not think about preserving it as knowledge. We didn't realize it is actually part of our cultural knowledge. It contains precious information about the way we organize our lives, our businesses, our entertainment, and we need to preserve it the same way other particular parts of our cultural heritage are preserved. This has not been done up to now, and software heritage has taken over the long overdue mission of actually collecting all the source code around the world, preserving, making sure we, it is not lost, and making it easily accessible from a single place in a uniform way for everybody, forever. What was the eureka moment for you? That moment when you said, oh my goodness, there's something actually very precious here. And if we don't, if we don't have a way to, to catalog it, if we don't have a way to make it accessible for future generations, something is going to be lost. When did that occur for you? Well, it, it, again, very, very good question. In, 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 as, as computer scientists of technology, we, uh, technology, we always look uh, at the, the future, the, future yes. you know, the, the new version of what is going to happen. And until you get to the moment where you actually we, you look back to a piece of software which is very important, you wrote maybe a year ago, or two years ago, three years ago, and oh my goodness, where was it? And what version did I actually use in this particular uh, tool or in this particular application, this particular experiment? And then you discover you are not so well organized as you hope to be, and then you start getting worried about this, and then later on, you see there are incredible amount of software made available in the world today. There, is, there are many, many, many millions of projects available. And then you discover that one of the places where you used to find it, I mean, the place where it is developed, take, for example, Glitorious or Google Code or SourceForge, which are platforms very used just 10 years ago, they, so all of a sudden, they go away. They are shut down. They are closed. And so the software you thought was there is no longer there. Where is it? Maybe somebody has moved it elsewhere, but you don't have an archive, you don't have a catalog, you don't have a, a way of storing and finding all this information uh, easily and efficiently. So when you discover this, the big question is, hey, really nobody ever took care of all this? Well, you know, there is always a first time. It so happened that we were the first one to actually not only notice the problem, it has been noticed before, but we actually decided to take action and actually produce Software Heritage, which is an initiative, they really open to bring together 
all concerned parties to build an archive that is there to last and it's there to be used by a lot of people. I just want to uh, let everybody know that if you want to be part of the conversation, uh, hashtag our hashtag, Software Heritage. Software Heritage. Uh, is that on this thing here? Not yet. No, we'll, you we'll, just put a hashtag we'll put here. We'll put a hashtag exactly right here. here. And so, hashtag Software Heritage. And in addition to that, um, you know, if you've got a question, just write it into our comments and uh, we'll try to get that question to Roberto uh, so that uh, he can respond directly to you uh, for your, uh, you know, for, you know, for your information. The, I guess when, when, when we get down to it then, this resource is, is kind of the equivalent of when archaeologists discover uh, ancient tablets, for example, in Egypt or in Greece or, or in India, um, where, you've, where there is a story to be told. And so the source code is more than just these numerical features. It's a story. Absolutely. And it's You're the story right. of what? Well, there are many things. I mean, this computer technology actually was invented just half a century ago. So there is a story that men and women who spent incredible amount of time and energy to make it actually work, to, to develop the knowledge and the technology we use today. But let me say, you said that archaeology, I would not like to give the impression that software heritage is some dusty place where you put old stuff you don't care about. Not at all. Software heritage is much more than that. Of course we preserve old software, but we also track all the development of new software today. So it's a fantastic vantage point from which you can look at and observe all the software development of the world today and track its history, how a piece of code has been built, where, by whom. And that's the real value of this unique point of view on all that is done in the software technology worldwide. Okay, but what, then, that's, then I guess the, the, the follow-up question to that is, what's the application for someone who's writing, who's writing code today? And they, maybe they hit a block on something. They think, well, I think I'm going to check out the Software Heritage Archive and, and see if I can search through that archive and find something that maybe inspires me, maybe gets me thinking in another way about, about finding a solution to this software issue that I'm having, this source code issue that I'm having, in that it's not working the way I want it to. Uh, yes, that's definitely one of the applications we think of, but in the future, because right now, you know, just the challenge of collecting all the software structure and you put it in a single place is overwhelming. But of course, we are working with partners, researchers, company. Today, for example, we announced that we are working with Quant, which is a search engine, uh, an advanced search engine here in France, to develop special tools for doing search inside the source code. And the other value of using software heritage instead of another tool for building software is that we actually we collect software from all over the places. So we provide a unified view on everything which is done worldwide. But again, this is a vision. Right now, you cannot do yet what you want. You will be able in the future if everybody contributes to the development of the platform. I think all we have to do is just point out really the first part of this is that we are, we building. are building. So it's building. happening now, the Universal Software Archive. So this is a process that is underway. And actually, people who are watching us can contribute to this. Absolutely. But, you know, there are so many... I mean, I come from the free software and open source world since, uh, since the very beginning. So my principles are really transparency, openness, collaboration. And this is something we have built into software heritage from, since the very beginning. All that we do, I mean, the software we develop to build the, this library is open source and people can contribute. You just go to forge.softwareheritage.org, you can contribute to the code. Forge? Forge, F-O-R-G-E. -E. E -E. Exactly. Softwareheritage.com. Dot .org. Oh, dot .org. Yeah, we are not a company. Are <laughs> yes, absolutely. Dot .org. You can do that. Sort, Softwareheritage.org. Absolutely. You can contribute to it and you can, to the code, or you can uh, convince people or donors to, 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 to provide us with resources and money to work on this, or you can just add to the documentation, or you can talk about it, and you can even make donations if you want to, to show a token of appreciation of what you do. See, we are trying really to make, to have all doors open for collaboration in so many different ways. You know, right now, we're actually standing above a space here at UNESCO where the archiving of uh, UNESCO documents, uh, 
correspondence, letters, photos, videos, is actually taking place. And so, in a similar way, it's not ready for, for prime time, so to speak. It's not ready to be accessed. It's not ready to be, um, to be used. But we are building this archive in the same way that you are building this archive. Now, your archive, however, already has four billion source code files. Absolutely. I mean, that's not, a, that's not a small number. Not at all. And, and, and actually, if you look at the number, there, there are, are mind-boggling. There are over 80 million uh, software origins that we track, and this boils down to four billion and a half individual source code files, which are all different. And the good news is that today, even if we are still building this uh, archive, and it's a long-term project, Today we are here at UNESCO because working together we have decided to announce to the public that now you can come and look inside. And so like you are digitizing all the information at UNESCO but you cannot look inside it yet, you will be able to do it in the future. Well now you are already able to look inside what is in Software Heritage. Just go to archive.softwareheritage.org, very easy, archive.softwareheritage.org and search. There are so many impressive pieces of code which are stored forever and with precise reference you can share with your friends and they will be there for the long time. Okay, this is going to be a hard question because in some ways these are all your, your babies. You know, you've been working on this, you're gathering up all this, but I have to ask, of all the source code that you have already, of this four billion, much of which you've probably seen, which is your favorite? Oh, oh my goodness. I mean, so <laughs> if I pick a favorite, I, I make a lot of unhappy people. But let, let yeah, more than 3.9 billion. <laughs> yes. So let, let, let's provide some pointers. So what I have shown in the presentation just a few minutes before is the ability to dig into the source code of the command system that was used in Apollo 11 to put a man on the moon. That's impressive. That work is impressive, what made under the direction of Margaret Hamilton, one of the first ladies working in modern computer science in history. She's still alive. She's an incredible lady, and she wrote the 60,000 lines of code. Well, not all to alone, but with that. A other, team. They over, oh, she oversaw the team to doing this, and you can look inside it. You can look at the source code of one of the first popular games uh, which was Quake 3, I mean the ancestor of uh, Call of Duty, you can look at the source code of Mosaic, the first web browser, which was actually the one that popularized the web. There are so many things you can look for. And then, of course, I, 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 am, I come from formal theoretical computer science at the origin, so there are precious pieces of code for proof assistance, for compilers, or something like this, but that are probably less accessible to the general public than the three ones we mentioned before. You just go around and dig in. There are so many things to discover. Now, I just want to point out to you know to our our friends on Facebook, you know, the source code for Call Call of Duty, <laughs> the source code for what was the other game that you made? All games. Quake. Quake. Yeah, Quake. All this source code that you that you enjoy, but you see, of course, in its in its in its feature as a as a user friendly uh, manifestation of the source code. That's why this is important. I mean, not just for gaming, but also for getting to the moon and back. Yes, absolutely. Which is, you mentioned something that I found interesting when you said that, she, that uh, Margaret is still alive. Sure. How important is it that you have started this initiative now? Because clearly there are many people who have been writing code who are here to talk about it still. Uh, absolutely, you are very right. I mean, we have a privilege in our uh, discipline in computer science and computer technology that this is a young discipline. So most of the people who actually created this, created the theory, created the application, created the software, and the tools we are using today are still alive. Most of them, not all of them, because, I mean, you know, biology uh, works uh, in a particular way which is not reversible. And so most of these people are still around. They are willing to contribute their knowledge, their, 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 their source code in different ways. There are many institutions that try to make interviews with them. They are the Computer History Museum we are working together with. But now we have finally a place where their source code can be stored safely in a single place with a uniform interface for everybody to find and maintain in the future. So it's urgent to take action because now we have a tool. We need to get the people on board. And also I think it's urgent to take action because you can hear you can hear about the, the about the creation 
from those who created. Absolutely. And what and what inspired them to create? What motivated them to create? And how they were channeling then their energy into source code. Uh, absolutely. And so, but here again, we at a sort of heritage. We want just to build this library of source code available for everybody, and then partner with many institutions, like uh, cultural heritage institutions, that can make interviews. Like for example, the Computer History Museum is an impressive place where they make interviews with many people in Silicon Valley, for example. But we should do the same here in France, we should do the same in other countries, because computer technology actually was born and invented in many different places at the same time. And I have to say that in our, uh, in our communication and information sector, which deals with issues related to uh, communication, the, in other words, how we communicate, internet, etc., also freedom of expression, uh, um, is, is really where this partnership at UNESCO exists between, the, between us uh, in terms of that sector and, and INRIA and the Software Heritage uh, uh, Absolutely. Thanks, George, initiative. for asking the question. Actually, you know, this project is fascinating. That's the reason we don't sleep much in, in our team because they are so excited working on it. But to succeed, we need really three pillars. One pillar is science and technology to build this tool the proper way. That's the reason it is so important to be supported by INRIA, which is a national research center in computer science in France that has given born to some much bad, good technology, partner with uh, great companies around the world working on, on information technology, maybe Google, Microsoft, many others. But we also need resources. This doesn't come for free. It has a cost to build all this. So we need sponsor, we need support, we need contribution in, in, to build this infrastructure. But even these two things are not enough. Not just science and technology, not just money. What we need is awareness, making people aware of the importance of software source code as part of our cultural heritage. And this is one of the main missions where UNESCO is key for our strategy and, to, and the collaboration is so important because UNESCO has taken care of so much of cultural heritage. Now it is turned to move into the 21st century and bring part of this cultural, cultural heritage which is technological, which is software source code, inside the conversation. Okay? That's a place, uh, this UNESCO is the right place to make this happen. Well, I mean, and on top of that is the important role that all of our our friends on Facebook play because Absolutely. the awareness is about you sharing this uh, Facebook Live. Uh, tell your friends, let them know about what we're doing here. Final question, what's in the future? Where does ah, this go? So uh, I would like to say the sky is the limit, but I mean the, the future is, first of all, expand the coverage of the archive. You need to track so many other pieces of software which are missing. The second is actually expand the partnership. We need to have a lot of people working on all this. I mean, students, corporation, companies, etc., and make it easier to use and to understand. So now everybody's talking about uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc., etc. Well, let's use uh, some of this to make the 83 million software sources which have archived easier to find, easy to reuse, easier, easier to classify. There are so many things to do. And so the future is creating a foundation right now to make it clear that many people can contribute, expanding the team, getting more money, getting more people aware, getting so many more projects inside the archive. Roberto Thanks a lot. Cosmo, thank you so very much. I just want to remind everybody, uh, you can uh, watch this later. Uh, also, share it uh, with your friends. Don't forget, hashtag Software Heritage. Pretty straightforward. Uh, be part of the conversation, and we'll continue to monitor how things are going. Hope to have you Absolutely. back with us on Facebook to tell us more about how the progress uh, on the archive uh, is uh, progressing. Absolutely. And thanks to all of you from uh, live Thank from you. Paris. I'm George Papianas with Roberto De Cosmo, the director of Software Heritage, wishing you a great day wherever you are.